Okay, uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Konnichiwa. Um, I'm Reina Kaneko. I think I know most everyone on the screen, but I'm Reina Kaneko. I'm president of JASH, Japan American Society of Hawaii. Thank you so much for joining us during today's first installment of the Taste of JASH Nomu edition, featuring Kohana Distillers. Um, some of you may be familiar with our Taste of Jash series. We started back in 2019, featuring food and education about our sister states in Japan. So during those TOJ events, we feasted on regional cuisine, learned about regional hotspots, and enjoyed company of our Jash friends. We decided to expand on TOJ concept, but this time feature local distillers who source their ingredients locally. But before we begin, before we dive into this evening, um, I want to introduce our moderator for today, um, Del Tanioka. You can wave, Del. <laughs> okay, so Del is from Hilo. She grew up on the Big Island. Um, she lives on Oahu now. She's currently a medical technology and billing company um, uh, account executive, I guess, uh, from, and she oversees accounts in Hawaii, Alaska, California, and Nevada. Uh, Del was originally um, an educator. So she started her, her career as a, a preschool teacher at KCAA and eventually moving on to our Redeemer Lutheran schools where she started the preschool program there. Um, after eight years as preschool director and coordinator um, Dell served as the Oahu coordinator for Patch, People Attentive to Children, overseeing numerous programs. Dell is a very active member of the JASH Next Gen Committee, and she also served on our JASH Golf Tournament Committee, where she assisted in producing one of the most successful JASH golf tournaments, which was back in uh, last, just this past summer in July. Uh, Del was elected the second president of Junior Chamber International, JCI Honolulu chapter in 2017 and has served um, and served last year as the 77th state president of JCI Hawaii. Most recently, Del was elected as vice chair for the JASH Next Gen Advisory Committee. So very active in the community. So we're very pleased to have Dell as a moderator. So I'm turning it over to you, Dell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rena. Um, yeah, when you talk about it like that, it sounds like I did a lot of stuff. Doesn't really feel like doing <laughs> it though. <laughs> um, before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. So today, we're, as you can tell, we're using a Zoom item format, meeting format. Um, all of you are currently muted. However, if you do have questions, please type them into the chat and we'll try to get them um, to, our, to our special guest today. So, um, if you feel comfortable, please turn on your camera so we can see everybody and kind of like have a, you know, kind of interactive kind of feel to this. Um, so let me, get, let me just dive right into it. Um, tonight, we are so honored to have from Kohana Distillers, Kyle Rutner and Tevis Freitas. So Kyle is the general manager for Kohana Distillers. Kohana Distillers is Hawaii's first vertically integrated distillery where every ounce of rum is made with heirloom Hawaiian sugarcane grown on their own farm. So, I mean, that's just a great way to, you know, reuse sugar because we have all that land that was there for sugar. So <laughs> we got to use it, right? Yep. Um, that's grown on their own farm. In addition, Kyle is currently working with Dave Power and the owners of FET on creating a beverage program in Waikiki. With his degree in chemistry and over 15 years in the restaurant industry, Kyle is one of the few people that has worked in all aspects of from producing spirits, mixing cocktails, and creating hospitality programs. Before joining Kohala Distillers, Kyle's work behind the bars and in Honolulu under the tutelage of Christian Sell, Dave Newman, and John Schwabinitz. <laughs> Kyle has been able to make a name for himself nationally. In 2012, he was recognized as one of the 10 mixologists to watch by Beverage Media. He has competed in many competitions representing the Aloha State and has had his drinks featured in Travel and Leisure and Food and Wine amongst countless others. Tevis is the brand manager and mixologist and he began his career in the restaurant industry as a dishwasher and worked his way through the ranks, heading the beverage program for Eating House, 
1849 in Waikiki and concocting signature cocktails for Roy's restaurants throughout the islands. Having experience with Roy's ever-evolving menu has shaped his outlook on flavors, textures, and cuisines from around the globe. In addition, Tevez has been featured in numerous publications, local TV, and he has participated in more than a handful of cocktail competitions. The unique story and process of Kohana Distillers are amidst many of the reasons why Tevez jumped at the chance to, own, to join this company. As the brand manager, he is honored to partake in the work Kohana has been doing to revitalize sugarcane farming in Hawaii and their efforts to preserve history. So um, I don't know about you guys, but I am a big fan of rum <laughs> and, mix, and, dr and mixed drinks and um, bartenders in general. So <laughs> we are so honored to have them here with us today. Um, so I'd like to welcome Kyle and Tevis. Welcome. Hello, hello. Thank Thanks you for having us, Del, and everybody else at Jash. We're thrilled to be here. Um, honestly, it's, it's a joy to be able to share our story, and we're grateful to be able to partner and talk story with you guys. So thanks for inviting us. Uh, if you are tuning in this time, you must tune in again when our friend Ken Harada does the next one. So don't just be here for the Kohana one. Also show up for our friends at Namihana. Uh, I'll let Tevis lead the way today, but we are so, so thrilled. Uh, I'm going to piggyback on a few of the things Kyle just said, and we, we are very excited to take part and talk story with everyone. Um, and really the honor is all ours. Perfect. Should we get going with a video and then we'll talk from there? Kohana is essentially two Hawaiian words. Ko being sugarcane and hana meaning work. Our concept in a lot of ways is the work of the cane. It's really our farmers hand harvesting and crushing all this cane. It's also in our distilling and production team. Essentially, there's just no shortcuts here, ever. Go the long way for the right reasons. There's a few really exceptionally unique things that we do here. One of them is that we have barrels made from coal wood, which is an endemic tree that only grows here in our islands. No one's ever done it before, right? So it literally stands on its own. Archaea, which is our white rum expression, it is literally the heart and soul of everything we do here. It is the foundation and the building block of our barrel aged spirits, of our cacao honey fused spirit as well. Archaea is it's very versatile in a lot of different ways. It's an excellent sipper because of the complexity that's there, but it's also fantastic in cocktails as well. So our rum is no exception. It fits very well into those recipes. When you taste our white rum, what you're tasting is the terroir of Kunia, of this particular portion of Hawaii, and you're being connected to this place. To be able to transport someone with just a simple taste of our spirit to Kunia, to here, to Hawaii, um, and I don't think there's anything that could be better than that. Fantastic. All right, we're done. There we go. Just kidding. <laughs> Tevis took care of it all right there. See you later. Uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Now we get to do the fun stuff. Yes, indeed. So as Tevis said in the video, um, there is a lot going on here, and it all starts at the farm. Uh, over 10 years ago, we started harvesting, sorry, planting, watering, taking care of all of these heirloom sugar canes. And it's been a joy to do that ever since. Um, in our collection, we have, what? 34 different varietals of cane. You go ahead. Yeah, 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 of course. 
lead the way, Tevis. Yeah, so I mean, some of the things that make us really unique in what we do, you know, a lot of places in the world make rum, of course, but uh, we grow all of our sugar cane ourselves, uh, which we kind of highlighted a bit here. We only grow heirloom cane. So these are varietals of cane. The 34 in our collection actually have not been modified in any way. Like scientists haven't genetically crossbred them, uh, which makes them really special. These are basically the uh, varietals of cane Hawaiians began bringing here over 1100 years ago. Um, sugar cane isn't from Hawaii, it was brought here. And uh, we prioritize only using sugar cane that basically the Hawaiians use. Yeah, and it's, it's an interesting thing to look at because most people will tell the world story where sugar cane starts in Papua New Guinea, India or China, travels through the continent of Asia, eventually finds its way to the Middle East, uh, famously with pharaohs, and eventually ends up in the hands of kings and queens in Spain, France, and eventually England. It hitches a ride with Columbus on a boat in about 1492, gets to the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean, and, you know, sugar booms the world over. You've got very... Uh, cheap or free labor you've got land that you've taken over and eventually it just sort of like takes over the world the history of sugar is wild what most people don't realize is in the 1800s when plantations started growing in hawaii that's 900 years after co actually arrived on these islands so we have canes that have provenance in this place that predate the caribbean by 500 years and were brought here 300 years before kings and queens ever had even tasted sugar in Europe. So really an amazing, amazing historical crop. And because, as Tevis alluded to, it hasn't been messed with or modified, we are able to grow those same crops uh, to make our rums with. Yeah, the timeline is very interesting. I mean, from anyone who's really dived into the world of rum is going to think of the Caribbean when you think of rum, and that's a fair thing to think of, but I guess the thing that gets kind of lost is that sugarcane was here in Hawaii long before it was in the Caribbean, and it was used much differently than how it was used elsewhere in the world. You know, the Hawaiians actually use sugarcane uh, as part of their day-to-day -day life, really. They use it for many interesting purposes that I guess you wouldn't really jump out and think about at first, but um, one of them that was really interesting to me is finding out that they actually use the the meat inside of the stock is fibrous. So they would actually use that, those fibers as a way to brush their teeth, which, I mean, if you think about it in 2021, I'm going to brush my teeth with sugar. The ADA would love yeah, that. I would, I'd, I'd laugh at my daughter as well, but <laughs> it makes sense when you think back a thousand years ago, you know, you're going to utilize things that you have access to. And it kind of makes sense when you think of it that way. Other things they did, I mean, medicinal uses, you know, the sweetness of the sugar would help them to consume um, their bitter herbs or bitter tonics they would need to, to use to feel better, essentially. So um, the Mary Poppins song I, it always jumps out. I hear her singing it right now, but a teaspoon of sugar helps the medicine go down. So Hawaiians kind of understood that um, many, many, many years ago, centuries ago, even that. Um, they would uh, they were very, you know, reading through more of the history, some of the things that I found really interesting as well is that um, they, they kind of theorize that the Polynesians may have settled in Hawaii, if not last, one of the last island chains that they discovered. And the native Hawaiians who settled here were very agriculturally savvy, um, supposedly more than a lot of the other Polynesian settlers who were more reliant on the ocean. But the Hawaiians here by the time Western civilization arrived here, they had seen that the Hawaiians learned to irrigate the water from the mountains down into the flatlands to feed their crops, to hydrate their crops, which is relatively advanced techniques, thinking back to literally a millennia ago. Um, so sugarcane amongst a lot of their crops just was growing phenomenally here for them. And it was kind of the cash crop. You know, I feel that before the thought of militarizing this place existed, um, the thought of sugarcane was there beforehand, really. For sure. What's, what's unique about these canes, too, when you think about traveling the world not as a commodity, but instead as a sustenance, remember that sugarcane is the most calorically dense plant in the world, so more calories per pound. And the Hawaiians brought about 20, it's somewhere between 24 and 26 <laughs> plants and animals with them. So when you think about 
you know, this, this cane, it's used to thatch the sides of homes. You could, you know, use it for sustenance. You could use it as like a berm in wetland lo'i uh, where kalo is planted. There's just a million things to do. Not unimportantly, all of the different plants are different in flavor, in sugar content, and in history. So we can wax poetic ad nauseum about all of the amazing things. And if you're really interested in this side of things, I would chase down Dr. Noah Lincoln, his book, Ko, K-O with the Kaha Ko, the line over the O, is the prime example of someone chasing their dreams and really teaching people about Hawaii food systems. It's an amazing book and something to, to really go at. We have a thousand years worth of history. Tevis and I just tried to get some of it at you in five <laughs> minutes. Um, what's great about the rums we make is we're able to grow these plants and showcase the rums just like a vintner would showcase their grapes. So when you think about a winery growing grapes, they're going to grow Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, Pinot Grigio, Carignan, whatever it may be. Um, and they're going to use those to whatever end they want. Sometimes they're going to make them to blend together. Sometimes they're going to make them to individually share them as like you would when you drink a Cab Sauv. We only use one cane type at a time and we are the only place in the world doing that. So it's a really fantastic thing to be able to share. When, our, when you look at our name, Kohana, the work of the sugar cane, it is truly that. Um, in the same vein, with all of the canes giving their own sort of essence to these rums, the flavors of each are massively uh, interesting and different. Do you wanna go through maybe a quick like tasting on how to taste spirits yeah, and start absolutely. with Kea uh, and we can go with it. Yep. So I'm gonna let Tevis lead you through a little tasting, but before we do that, our rums are fermented, distilled right here in Kunia. They're also grown on one of our four farms, two farms in Kunia, one in Haleiwa and one in Waialua. We have about 312 acres of heirloom Hawaiian sugarcane that all plays into this. So we'll harvest about a quarter of an acre in a day, crush it, get four tons of cane, 500 gallons of juice, and bring that up to our distillery to start, start the scientific sort of experiment that is fermentation, which is just yeast consuming sugar and making alcohol. Then we're gonna put that inside of our still, distill it, which is just a fancy way of saying we heated it up and collected the good bits, and that becomes our rum. When you come on site, we'll be able to show you really in depth how every bit of it works, but I think going through how to taste and what it is, is more elucidating than anything else. All right, well, let's, let's pour some rum out then. I think it's a good time to wet the whistle a bit. So, I mean, tasting and smelling, it's, it's a fairly subjective topic, right? So everyone does it a little differently. Um, and personally, I don't believe there's a wrong way to taste. I think as long as uh, I think you're enjoying the experience one way or another, I think you're doing it right. Um, there's a way of tasting that I learned a while back and it was a whiskey tasting that I was a part of and uh, quite honestly it's stuck with me ever since so I taste <laughs> anything that's liquid I taste this way at this point so um, but the way I was taught was to kind of really allow your senses to kind of work together in this part of the process so the first thing you're going to connect with is your vision right so you're going to look at what's in your glass Typically, you would want to hold it up in the light, and you're, you're just looking for the hue that's coming through. Like with our white rum, it's crystal clear, water clear, so there's not much going on there. But that's important to note because you're going to end up tasting this as well. After looking at it, you kind of want to start to smell, right? And there's a few different ways to go about this. The one that I find to be the most interesting is to smell, to in, inhale slowly through your nose with your mouth open a, bit, a tiny bit. And the, the theory is that you have way more receptors on your, of taste buds than you do in your nasal cavity. So you're gonna allow the scent to travel through your, nas your nasal passageway and start allowing that smell to flow over your taste buds. So you're gonna begin 
to really taste it before actually putting it on your palate. It does a second thing, which is it will allow you to not be doing like an inhale exhale situation where like when you go in, let's say you were to pour one of our rums and you go in and you really give it a deep sniff. I got a big old nose, right? So it's going to dull your senses right here and you're going to smell the same thing over and over. Whereas if you open your mouth just a touch, it actually lets some of those vapors dissipate and disappear. So there's, there's a real beauty in it. Now, what do we look for when we're tasting? When we're actually tasting. Yeah. Or when you're smelling. Well, your, your, your palate is affected differently by different types of flavors, right? So generally you have, you know, spicy, sweet, uh, what else am I missing? Salty, bitter, spice, or excuse me, bitter. Umami is the, uh, mm -hmm. the mythical part of the palate. And these, depending on which effect you're getting, is going to react differently on your actual palate or in your mouth, so to speak. What we're getting from our rum, it is fresh. It's very fresh. It's made from fresh sugarcane juice, which is actually vastly different than most of the world's rums. And when we say most, over 95% of the world's rums are made from molasses. So we're really falling into a distinct category here. Generally, we're going to get a lot of fresh scents here, right? So fresh cut grass is something that really comes across in a lot of our white rums, regardless of varietal. Different varietals are going to give you different effects as well, different characteristics. But I do feel that that freshly cut grass really sings across the board most of the time. Yeah, and I tend to find myself looking for in clear spirits, whether it's rum, mezcal, tequila, vodka, I look for high notes first. I look for things that are grassy and bright and vibrant. And then I find myself looking for the fruits. So when, when we're distilling, we get some really unique notes at different times during the distillation process. So it's, I'm able to, to really pull out different things at different times. But when you're opening a bottle, they're all coalescing together. So when you're opening a bottle of Kohana rum, hopefully you're getting a big booming cane nose followed by some tropical fruits. And maybe at the end of the palate, some herbs and spices, maybe some, I get like the aftertaste of eating red hot sometimes, or I get like that, like sort of muted mint uh, or anisette note, which are both really unique to, to what we do. Um, we didn't define the word earlier. Uh, on our bottles, it's Kohana Hawaiian Agricole Rum. Agricole is actually a French designation. It means agricultural. And our play on this is as Hawaiian Agricole, it, it relates back to Hawaiian agriculture. It's fresh sugarcane juice as opposed to molasses. So massively important in what we do. Let's move mm. on and taste an aged or a Coco Leca and then... Okay. We owe them some mixed drinks too. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's do, so I know not everyone has a bottle of the barrel age rum with them right now, but we're going to just uh, pour a little bit out and we'll, we'll talk about it anyway. Cause this is, this is part of our core lineup of expressions and uh, quite frankly, one of the most popular. Plus we're sitting in the barrel house. So it, it seems does make sense. <laughs> necessary to uh, actually do this. This is not a background. This is actually uh, our, home base for barrel aging. And as the only distillery in Hawaii, barrel aging stuff we make ourselves in uh, and grow ourselves in a massive amount like this, it's nice to be able to show it off. So it's, it's a labor of love and a half. So the same way you dig into the other spirit, you'll go into this, but instead of looking for high notes and tropical notes, you're going to be looking for the things that that wood adds to it, which is obviously like a golden hue. You get that nice like bourbon brown to it with notes that, that tend to evoke winter and, you know. I get the fall time a lot. Yeah, for I, sure. I, I love sipping on a barrel aged spirit when, when, well, I guess we're in Hawaii, so the weather's not really changing, but you guys know what I mean. Sure. I like to imagine that, you know, the leaves are falling off the trees right now as I'm smelling this. Mm -hmm. And there's baking spices and, and all these fantastic notes that, that tend to go with this time of year, even in Hawaii, where it's just a little colder, just a touch different. And, and honestly, we deserve the, the change in what we consume as well. So 
think, you know, since we're on the subject of our barrel aged spirits and we're in the barrel house, I think it's also important to note that generally whatever goes into a barrel is, is crystal clear like this, right? So all of this color and additional flavor and aromatic that we're getting through our barrel aged spirit, a lot of this is indicative of the wood from the barrel, you know? Before I went into that barrel, it looked like our K, our white rum. So all of this is just interacting with the type of wood that our barrels are made of. Majority of what you're seeing behind us is made of American white oak, which is actually the same type of wood that is used to create the barrels that bourbon is aged in. So like Kyle was saying, we got, you know, distinct baking spices, which is a common characteristic found in American style whiskeys. Um, also maybe like some orange zest, a little hint of citrus. I typically get like a burnt orange zest. Um, if you go to a fancy enough cocktail bar, the bartender may just flame a lemon zest. That's normally the smell that I'm typically getting in a barrel aged spirit. But like we were saying earlier, it's very subjective. So um, I also like to note that if you smell or you taste something in a spirit, a wine, I like to encourage that person to, to, to believe in that, that it exists, it's there. And if someone else doesn't smell it, it's okay because the fact that this is a subjective experience um, and it's important to, to not feel discouraged. If, it, if you smell it, you see it, you taste it, it exists and it's there. And uh, that's just what your palate or your, what your brain is essentially, the message you're receiving. Yeah. And, and remember that we don't all have to be sommeliers about everything. Sometimes the answer is just, oh, I like it or, oh, I don't. And then you go from there. Your choice is your choice. We get caught up all the time as spirit specialists uh, with our wine friends or with our spirits friends. And, and you try to name every single thing that you have. And sometimes you forget to just enjoy it. With rum is fun. Rum is fun. So we can kind of get out of our own way. Yes, I can talk about marzipan and pondon and these, you know, wild different flavors that can come come along. But I can also just say, wow, that's delicious. Let's let's share this with awesome humans. And that's what this whole business is about, opening bottles with the right people and sharing a little bit of Hawaii. So we're really, really fortunate. Speaking of sharing a little bit of Hawaii, we do have one product in our entire line that we actually add other Hawaii products to, which is going to be locally grown cacao and locally harvested honey as well. So that's going to be our Coco Leca. <laughs> kind of hard um, to see. But... And this is like <laughs> just the winner winner. I mean, people adore it. It's fantastic. It's 30% ABV. Again, it's called Coco Leca. The aged drum is called Coho, K-O-H-O. And our white rum, just like the famous mountain, is Kea, K-E-A. So Kea, Coho, and Coco Leca. Coco Leca meaning chocolate in Hawaiian. We work with Manoa chocolate and Manoa honey to make this deliciousness. How do we make it? Okay, so we actually, so like I was saying, this is a fully local product, which is really special. Uh, we're able to source locally grown cacao nibs um, and steep that into our rum. It takes about a month, it's about a month long process. Now, when we're done with those nibs, something that's really cool is that we'll, we'll dry the nibs out and Manoa chocolate, the chocolatier we work with, they will actually create Kohana rum bars from those used nibs, which is fantastic. Um, nothing is going to waste. Um, but raw chocolate has a distinct bitterness to it, right? So we're going to have to balance that flavor profile out. And in order to do that, we actually team up with uh, Manoa Honey, five miles up the road here in Wahiwa. They're doing one too, right? I don't know. Are they? I They're doing something, the right? Yeah. Well, anyway, we, start, we source uh, macadamia nut blossom honey, and we were able to add that to our Coco Leca. And essentially, I mean, we're not looking to make it sweet. We're looking more so for balance in it, but it is going to sweeten it because honey is, of course, sweet. But we don't want this to be too sweet. We don't want it to be too chocolatey. We want it to be too bitter. We kind of want it to be balanced right in the middle somewhere. So yeah, And it's really fantastic. Most people don't realize that Hawaii is the only state that can grow cacao nibs. So growing American grown chocolate, Hawaiian chocolate are synonymous. There's nowhere else in the US that chocolate can be grown. So it's a really fantastic and unique thing for an American distillery to be able to do. So we are all about it. And as Teva said, we do make chocolate bars with the nibs afterwards. So, you know, we'll have hundreds of pounds go into a large vat of our white rum, soak in there for a long time, we pull those out, dry them, give them to Dylan uh, Butterball over at Manoa Chocolate. Then we'll add in our freaking awesome Manoa honey. 
blend that around, let it sit, cut it down just a little bit to 30% ABV. And it is good with ice cream, with coffee, by itself over ice, off of your favorite human. It just doesn't matter. It's so good. Uh, it works in every single instance uh, the world over. So cheers to Salute. that. Cheers. And to our distillery team who has gone home for the night. Thanks for making awesome, awesome Thanks, rum. <laughs> uh, we appreciate them always. Um, we get asked all the time, really two questions, which is, are you always drunk? And the answer is no. And the second is, what do I do with your awesome rum? Which we have, you know, a, a simple answer, which is drink it. But more complicated answer is, Honestly, we tell people to make daiquiris all the time. So Tevis is going to mix you up a classic daiquiri, which so is <laughs> truly the way to do this. So whether it's our aged drum, our white rum, they work incredibly well in daiquiris. For Coco Leca, this cacao and honey liqueur, like I said, you cannot go wrong with it. I do really tend to like it in my coffee evening time coffee, not morning time coffee. I'm not that guy. <laughs> but if you are that guy, feel free, uh, get some Coco Leca in your life. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, yeah, shall mix we? It up to him? Yeah, let's, right. let's, let's just do a quick daiquiri. And you know, the thing is the daiquiri is far more simple than most people understand it to be. Um, I think I might've been guilty for a portion of my life to think that a daiquiri is meant to be blended, but it's actually just a very simple combination of three ingredients four if you want to include the ice as an ingredient which i would say it is anyway i could talk on and on about it forever but we're gonna do one and a half ounces of our white rum so let's say you're at home and you don't have a fancy jigger like my mixologist friend here one of the best things you can do is just do it by parts so whether you had just a thimbleful or a teaspoon or tablespoon it's going to be two parts of rum to one part of sugar water and one part of lime. So if you don't have a jigger, which, you know, honestly, it's not hard to come by, but not everybody has them. You just do two parts rum, one part of the others. So basically you have one part mix and one part spirit in the end, which is the, really the key to most cocktails. So Tevis is gonna have how much lime? Uh, we're gonna do three quarters of an ounce. Also oh, one and a half ounce of rum, is the two parts. The one part is going to be three quarters of an ounce of lime. Very awesome. I'm actually going to double up all my portions because I make sure I make one for my partner over here as well. This is a smart guy who keeps his job. <laughs> uh -huh. So a, a daiquiri is a little bit of a maligned drink, right? Most people think of it uh, in the TGI Friday style of, oh, it's going to come out as a strawberry blended drink. But the truth is it's a cocktail born in Puerto Rico or Cuba, depending on which island you're on and who you're fighting with. Um, but somewhere down there, they decided to mix delicious rum with fresh lime juice and fresh sugar. As they say, what grows together goes together and rum, lime and sugar are almost always found in the same places. I would argue that that should also include bananas I'm a big proponent of banana daiquiris. So I'm all in on that. Just like a little banana liqueur or a couple slivers of banana thrown into this. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I know banana is polarizing, but it's pretty good. <laughs> well, I mean, some at times, I, I sometimes get hints of banana in uh, some of our varietals of sugar cane. Right, so, what's this? so right here, we got some simple syrup. So this is just equal parts of sugar and water. Make sure that sugar dissolves down. Um, so for this, we did one cup of sugar, one cup of water, dissolve that in, and then we're, we're going to use this as our sweetening component. Nice. If you find that complicated to do, I would just take half of the amount of just granulated sugar, put it in your tin and take a little bit of water. And you can honestly just stir that together before you start the process and sugar will just dissolve in that water really quickly. Or you can even just shake with it. Um, and that's super old school daiquiri style where they would just use castor sugar and shake it in themselves. Speaking of shaking, this is gonna be the part where I make a little bit of extra noise. Wanna add your ice. 
seal your tin in this case. You use a mason jar. I think the mason jar is really the go-to, yep. most accessible. Let me shake this off to the side. And when we're shaking this drink, what we're looking for is to introduce a little bit of water by shaking this up, letting that ice kind of melt down a bit. We also have a little bit of air kind of getting whipped through this drink a little bit. So when we strain it out, you're going to see some, some bubbles, a little bit of foam. And that is what we're talking about with the air. And this is basically going to give us the right texture we're looking for in our drink. <clears throat> Wow, that looks so good. And um, we have a couple of questions coming in too, so um, if you don't mind. No, um, please ask away. Great. One of the questions is, is that, do you sell this rum in Japan? Yeah, and that's a great question. So we do not have a ton of distribution there, but we do have a partner, a uh, circus and company in Japan who has, um, who has our rum and can distribute it. Unfortunately, we started with them right as things were getting a little bad as far as the coronavirus and COVID-19. So uh, we have not found a lot of places for it to be, but we're hoping that with things opening back up, we will be able to spread it out a little bit, especially to some of the more mixology focused bars uh, and, and share it with people. It, it actually, when we very first started this company, one of the major goals was actually to share rum with Japan. Japan hadn't quite turned the corner into loving Caribbean rums yet. And part of what we really wanted to do and why we embraced so many of the French techniques and the terroir driven side is our friends in Japan, as you well know, really enjoy things that have provenance, that have a place. And Hawaii is one of those places. So we, we built this brand in a lot of ways at 80% ABV for our white rum instead of a higher, more sort of classic American proof and things like that. We really toned in to try to share it both with visitors that come to Hawaii from Japan and as an exportable product. So yeah, we embrace that really hard. It hasn't all gone in a linear path as far as being able to simply find our way to bars and restaurants in Japan and shelves. Um, but it is starting to starting to go that direction. Cheers. Cheers. That was an awesome question. Mm. So let's say you don't have Tevis sitting next to you like I do to make an awesome daiquiri. And, and that, although I think relatively simple, sounds like a little too much to do. We yesterday actually launched our ready to drink line. So if you're interested in getting the same well-crafted and well thought out daiquiris that Tevis and I both like, we now have pre-bottled already mixed classic daiquiris, lily koi daiquiris, grapefruit and pineapple. So you can take these home, pour them directly over ice and go that way. They'll be in stores sometime in late December, but they're already up here at the distillery. And if you're interested in visiting, come check us out. We, we just turned 10 years old. So we're going to do a really awesome special in about five or six more days. So next week, uh, we're going to probably start a perfect 10 and sell these daiquiris, which are actually priced at $20 for 10 bucks uh, for 10 days. Nice. So we're going to do the perfect 10 um, for a few weeks and try to share, get a little bit of uh, daiquiris in people's bellies right before Thanksgiving, uh, hopefully loosen them up for Black Friday, you know, the usual. <laughs> well, that's great because that actually kind of segues really nicely into our next question. Yeah. And that question was, um, what food goes best with rum? And I was going to, I was, if I was going to answer this question, I'd say all food, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Check. Yep. We're, we're okay with that answer. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. That, that question is a, a bit of a loaded one because rums can be so different from each other. For agricole <laughs> rums, especially unaged agricole, because they're so grassy and so vibrant, they tend to go with fresher and more lively dishes. So if you're going to put it next to a salad, I'd put it with a salad that's got some snap to it, something with like radishes or, or the like. Or if you're going to have it... Uh, honestly, I love it with like poke, but not like spicy poke. Mm -hmm. Instead, something a little bit more bright and vibrant, um, Hawaiian style, or even like 
the show you thing does something really cool with our white rum. So like show you poke is really dope. Um, those would be some really easy knee jerk ones for our age. Um, I tend to actually like it with more like Caribbean style flavors, a little bit more spice, something to push back against the vanilla flavors in there. And then the Coco Leca, I mean, honestly, it's just built for dessert. So whether it's cake or ice cream or something like that, um, are there any uses that you really just like love? Yeah, yeah. I'd say I'll, I'm going to go start backwards there. So I'm going to start with the Coco Leca. Um, the Coco Leca, I mean, coffee is a go to, obviously. Pouring it over ice cream is really good. I found that macadamia ice cream and Coco Leca, just that's a really great combination. Sure. Vanilla, yeah. <laughs> coffee ice cream, that's all good as well. Um, barrel age, I. It does. It's it's a little more robust. Um, has a little more structure. I actually like you know some some meat off the grill. You know cool. like some some barbecue ribs or that something. Makes sense. I, like I kind of like that. Well. Yeah, just yeah. a bit. The white rums, man. I'm so biased. I just feel like I drink it with everything I eat. But um, I do like things like a salad with a vinaigrette, something with a little zing. I feel like it, it pairs really nicely with that. Um, I think I'm probably just staying on daiquiri things. So I'm thinking of things that are a little more tart that pair well um fresh fruit could go well with it as well so uh once again it's kind of subjective when it all boils down to it yeah and then if you're if you're thinking about rums that aren't ours um there are it's just such a vast category it's it's difficult to define generally what you'll hear is you know caribbean food with whatever type of rum is the way to go that's a little too simplified however i think hopefully that our answer gives you some guidance as far as which which direction to go. You can get get yourself a, a Hemingway daiquiri, pour it over ice, and the grapefruit notes are really going to play well with any number of those sort of brighter, fresher things. I, I'm a fish guy, so I automatically think like, you know, either sashimi or poke or, you know, those like the, the lighter white fishes without too much sauce. Mm. So... That, that's a long, long answer we've just given, but we like food and drinks a lot. <laughs> a lot, like a lot. <laughs> yeah. Are there any more questions out there for us? So we also like food and drinks. <laughs> like we so we're all so here We really right appreciate now, right? your answers. It was <laughs> yeah. very, very detailed and I, I'm going to, I'm writing all of them down. <laughs> awesome. Um, we do have a question about, again, about what kind of flavors the daiquiris come in. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. There's, there's four daiquiris now. So the classic, which is going to be lime, sugar, and rum. So as core as it gets. So let's say you wanted something that was a little bit more Thanksgiving leaning. If you took just like one pomegranate and added the seeds to the top of a drink made with this, you would end up with like a more Thanksgiving driven feel. So this is the core that really you can play off of if you want to. Not that you need to because it's delicious as it is. Then there is a pineapple daiquiri, which is think the classic with some pineapple, fresh pineapple in there. It's going to be obviously really, really tropical on the like high pineapple note driven. Hemingway, which is this bright pink, which is really focused on ruby red grapefruit lime, maraschino liqueur, and kohana kea, and then lili koi, which is passion fruit, uh, local passion fruit. So lili koi, sugar, lime, and delicious rum. They all have the same sort of base with these like fun pops of different flavors. Um, all of them have their own sort of space in the cupboard, if you will, um, and, and shine in their own way. I, I tend to just really gravitate towards the classic because it's what I, what I adore, but people are going crazy for the pineapple. So I, I won't, I'm going I won't crazy for the Hemingway. That's personally. your one. I'm going crazy for the Hemingway, which is the grapefruit daiquiri. It's also just like really beautiful. It's right? Gorgeous. Yeah, <laughs> so are the daiquiris available, um, pretty much the same place the rest of the rums are available or since they're new are they um still not a, not as widespread they are they're only at the distillery right now so oh. distillery and online that's it so for for the moment uh we're greedy enough we want to show them off here and then they'll finally start finding store shelves sometime in december or depending on how long it takes people to do their resets on their floor which may not happen in december it may be january 
Um, but we have them here for you or via online order. So we have some guests from the mainland who are wondering, do you ship to the mainland? Yeah, it just depends on the state. We have a lot of reciprocal shipping. So like California is okay, Colorado, most of the West Coast, New York, Florida. Um, and then there's some, there's some places that don't allow it, but um, we can definitely take. Minnesota is an unfortunate no. I just saw that pop up at the bottom. There's some, there's some stuff in the Midwest just regarding just different licensing that it's been really difficult for us to get every single one. So we only have certain states, but they're all found online. Uh, Tevis probably knows them better than I do, but I, I know a few of them. Yeah. Um, fantastic. So if we can't go, to, if we're from Minnesota and we're, we're visiting Hawaii and we want to go visit your distillery, um, what time do you do? What do you, when do you do tours or can you tell us about uh, what that looks like? We do tours all of the time, except for four days a year. We close on the 4th of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year's. The rest of the year, we are open from 11 to 5, giving tours, giving tastings all day long. Uh, tours are on the hour, so 11, noon, 1, et cetera. And tastings are as people come in and decide to do it. So you could come in and do a cocktail tasting and try all four of these. You could come in and do the full tour, get to sample through four different rums. There's, there's a number of things. And our tour, you get to walk through our cane garden, Get to come in here actually exactly where we're sitting right now talk story about what happens in barrel aging and oxidative and subtractive and extractive aging then you get to go stand in front of our stills and talk about all of that so yeah we're open all the time uh if you're a kamaaina military um there are wonderful discounts for that so don't hesitate to just uh speak up and say uh the word and then yeah but it's it, our tours come with a tasting glass to take home you get the tasting it, it's quite the fun hour or so up here oh and what is the cost it's 25 dollars and 15 for kamaina fantastic yeah okay so uh, taste, tastings are 10 and your tasting cost goes against the price of a bottle if you want one. Oh, so if perfect. somebody was to come up and they're like, oh, I don't really have a half hour to do the tour, an hour to do the tour, I would like to do the tasting and see, and you pay $10 there. If you buy one of the rums, you get a $10 credit against it. So it's our oh, way of perfect. giving a free tasting under the Liquor Commission's rules. Brilliant. <laughs> I love it. Um, so we're just about closing in our time um if there's any last minute questions i'll take them now okay did you say that you aged it in koa so i think you did say that but right over here yep so they're a little here let me move this out of the way a little bit I, if i could lift a barrel i would <laughs> don't lift that barrel <laughs> but these these are our we have four koa casks over here we're the only people in the world aging spirits in that endemic hardwood, it's an acacia, absolutely gorgeous. Um, we will release the next Koa barrel, which will be barrel number five uh, of all time. So we've been around for 10 years. This will be the fifth barrel we've ever released um, sometime at the end of this month. So if you're interested in it, uh, it is quite the specialty. There's about 300 bottles in a barrel. Each barrel costs about $18,000 to make. So they are not inexpensive. They're, they're crazy, but very delicious and very fun and a, a killer gift uh, for your loved one or boss or for yourself. That's what I would do. <laughs> okay. We have one final question yeah. and that's going to be, which I feel is an appropriate question because it's at the end of the day, what do you drink for your Pauhana? I love it. You Ooh. first. <laughs> I, I'm truthfully i'll drink a daiquiri or i'll drink a raspberry mojito i raspberry mojitos with our white rum has been my favorite cocktail for probably about like the last 10 months maybe i love it yeah so i <laughs> i think that's a fantastic i i generally for my palhana will do one of our unaged spirits by itself no ice nothing but it's it's such a joy for me to be able to see something capture our field um so that's my palhana it's just a neat pour of kea 
um, and I kind of rotate through the different cane types and do that. If I'm not drinking Kea, I'm probably pouring myself, you know, a, a cold beer or something like that from one of the local breweries and supporting that side of things. But if I'm, if I'm here, especially, it's usually a neat pour of Kea with a, a nice like pale ale as the chaser for it. Love it. Beautiful. Well, thank you guys so much for, for providing this wonderful opportunity for our guests, you know, so we can learn about what you guys are doing out there at Kohana Distillers. Um, not only are you making delicious rum, but you're sourcing your ingredients locally, and that is fantastic for all of us. Um, just before we close out and we go into, you know, the jash part, can, yeah. you, can you really tell us, like, how do we get it online? And yeah. yeah, so so the Very best way one. is uh, www.kohanarum, all one word, dot com. And our shop is one of the first two things that come up there. You can see all of our line. Tevis does all of the upkeep of our web store. So it's really well curated. And you'll see everything from top to bottom that we offer. And we have a ton of specials coming up over the holidays. So don't hesitate to sign up for the subscriber link and that stuff and you'll get a bunch of benefits there. perfect that's what we wanted to know yeah um so thank you very much so once again for everybody that's listening if you enjoyed the program please consider becoming a member of jash or making a donation so we can continue to bring you quality <laughs> program please visit our website at www.jashhawaii.org to learn more about our organization and to view some of our past virtual programs and events. We've done some really, really cool, fun things. Um, FYI, coming up on November 18th at 5.30, join us for our second installment of the Taste of Jazz Nomo Edition uh, series with Hawaiian Shoju Company. The yeah. owner is Ken Hirata, and he will be sharing his story um, and distillery in Haleiwa. And we're going to learn how he produced, produces Oishi Shoju using locally sourced sweet potatoes. On behalf of the Japanese American Society of Hawaii, thank you for joining us today. A quick survey will be sent to you shortly. Please take the one to two minute survey. Tell everybody I did great. <laughs> <laughs> and help, <laughs> to help us bring you quality programming. Stay safe and healthy and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you very much. So awesome.